Hi, this is Andrew, and this is Keynote, the day now.tv chat show with some of the world's leading thinkers and writers. Hello, everybody. It is March the 11th, the Monday, 2024, beginning of the week. Old theme again today, the crisis of the internet. We've done many, many shows on the problems with the internet. Um, one, for example, uh, on uh, the age of surveillance capitalism, many were the leading critics of the internet, but we haven't done one with a man of the substance of Frank H. McCourt Jr., at least in business terms. He's a very prominent businessman, very well known broadly in the culture. He's owned the Los Angeles Dodgers and many other large corporations. He's also the man behind a new initiative called Project Liberty, which is advancing the responsible the development of the Internet of tomorrow and designed and governed for the common good. And Frank has penned a book, Our Biggest Fight, Reclaiming Liberty, Humanity and Dignity in the Digital Age. And he is joining us from New York City, from Hudson Yard. Frank, congratulations on the new book. Why? You're a busy man. You're not an author as such. You don't rely on the revenue from books. Why did you choose to pen this book, Our Biggest Fight? A very bold title. Well, yeah. Hi, Andrew. Nice to be with you. And let's be clear that yeah, the proceeds that I get from this book are going to Project Liberty because this is a this is a, a, a a hugely important project at what I would call a moment of crisis. And, um, you know, some might say, well, that's hyperbole. What do you mean by a, a crisis and uh, what's wrong with the tech? Yeah, I know it does some bad things, but doesn't it do good things, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and in your intro, you talked uh, uh, about a lot of the harms that we're learning more and more about every day in terms of the damage the current version of the internet is doing. And that, you know, that, it ranges from harms to young children to undermining democracy and everything in between. And the the insight that Project Liberty brings forward is that we can fix this and we must fix this. Uh, and certainly before we make this technology more par powerful with generative artificial intelligence, uh, we need to fix what's broken. And uh, in, in we, we can do this and uh, there is a tech fix to this. And then I think once we once we return ownership and control of data to individuals, which I would argue is where it's where it belongs and which I get to uh, in great detail in the book, uh, you know, data is uh, is our personhood. I, I think it's a mistake to just think of it as as data. It's everything about us in the world we live in now, which, which is a, a digital world. And so we need to reclaim ownership and control of that um, that information. And once we do that, and we create an internet that's more transparent and an internet where we're able to benefit economically from our, uh, our, our personal data, then I think we'll be on the right track and we'll enjoy the benefits of even more powerful technology. Frank, the subtitle of the book is Reclaiming Liberty, Humanity and Dignity in the Digital Age. Are you suggesting in our biggest fight and in your work at the Project Liberty, that we've lost, and these are big words, Frank, Li I don't need me to tell you that, liberty, humanity, and dignity. What has happened to liberty, humanity, and dignity in the digital age? Yeah, well, the way the tech is, is, is designed, which, you know, to scrape our, our, our digital information, all, all the information about us, and aggregate it in a, in a few big platforms, and then have it uh, uh, optimized uh, for things that these corporations uh, you know decide unbeknownst to us it, it, it is it is really as I said stripping us of our personhood and I don't think it's any exaggeration to say that we're becoming subjects again and we're losing our citizenship in a digital age the, what I talk about in the book I, I, I compare this to the American project you know one where uh, this, this this country was was created by people who uh, actually put the choice to uh, early settlers in what became the United States of America and said, look, you can continue to be a subject of a monarch or you can choose to be a citizen. That was the point Thomas Paine made in his pamphlet, Common Sense. And it, it was a very provocative choice and one that really put it to his, his fellow 
settlers uh, in the colonies. And it, it was, I think a light bulb went off for people saying, you know, we don't have to be a subject any longer to some somebody born into royalty, you know, and, and, and we, we have the same rights as that king or queen and we're born with them and they became known as our unalienable rights. Well, people fought long and hard for these rights and, and why on earth would we give them up just to be able to use the internet? Yeah, uh, internet uh, Frank, this is all very stirring, but you talk about the loss of personhood on, on the internet. I don't quite understand what you mean. I mean, of course, yes, the platforms take some of our data. They, they're annoying. They, throw advertising at us but how are we losing our personhood on twitter or facebook or linkedin or or, or tiktok or google I, I don't understand well you know there's a lot of discussion about tiktok right now and uh and you know this hue and cry that uh, tiktok should be banned be why because china is uh, scraping all this personal data about all of uh, all of us and uh, that, that that are on TikTok and all American citizens and and the Chinese Communist Party is you now has all of this pers vast amounts of personal information about uh, Americans. Well, but tell me, Andrew, how is the technology of of Twitter or Meta or Google different? Aren't they scraping and and um, what does that mean? Yeah, you, you've used this term, Frank, scraping personal data. It sounds rather dirty. What, what does that mean? I mean, TikTok, of course, is another story. Maybe we can get to that with China. I'm personally not on TikTok, so uh, I don't think TikTok has any access. Either TikTok or the Chinese government has any access to my own personal data. But leaving TikTok aside, what does that mean, scraping our personal data? The internet as it has evolved is, has become a highly centralized, autocratic, surveillance-based internet. It wasn't designed to be that. Uh, it was designed uh, to be a decentralized uh, uh, technology. It's become highly centralized in what's, uh, what we call the app era, the era of these big apps whether they're owned by China or the United States. And the way these apps work is by constantly uh, uh, accumulating, I would argue, stealing, scraping our data and aggregating it and then applying their algorithms to it for whatever purpose. You know, it may be a commercial purpose and which is uh, selling things or it may be a, a purpose of getting us to read something or think in a certain way or be provoked. The point is that there are tens of thousands of data points and uh, personal attributes of each of us that are now in the, the, the purview, the control of a few large platforms. As I mentioned in the book, in, nine, in 2016, uh, in, in ProPublica had uh, um, mentioned that uh, then Facebook had 50,000 individual attributes on everybody on Facebook, 50,000. Now that was, that, that number has surely increased in the last eight years. And that's just one, one platform. The, I don't think people realize the amount of information, i.e. everything, virtually everything about them is now digitized and is residing somewhere in someone's control. And it's, it's not democratic in the least. I don't think if, if I asked in, in, um, Andrew for you to choose three words or phrases to describe democracy, I don't think you would say centralized, autocratic, and surveillance-based. The, these, these platforms are scraping, accumulating our data, and then doing stuff with it. And I think this needs to be corrected so that the technology works for people, not just the objectives of these platforms. You mentioned Facebook. Again, I, I'm not on Facebook. People choose to go on it. It's a free service, for better or worse. Um, we, we can avoid these things, Frank, can't we? I mean, just choose, as some people might say, and certainly in Silicon Valley, if, if you don't, it's like that old uh, 
Uh, it's like that old Berkeley bumper sticker about abortion. Abortion, don't like it, don't have one. Can't we say the same about Facebook or Google or any of the other platforms? We can simply avoid using them. There are alternatives. There are lots of decentralized social media platforms, Mastodon, for example. There's DuckDuckGo if you don't like Google. Why can't we just sidestep these platforms? Well, it, uh, because there really is no alternative uh, uh, at the moment. You mentioned a few use cases, but they're very, very small in comparison. You know, we have, uh, we now have the largest decentralized, uh, decentralized social network in the world, and it's about 700,000 people. And that's a small fraction of what's required to have scale and to be a true, a true alternative that people will migrate to in mass, in mass numbers. The reality is this idea of putting quote free things in people's hands and get them to use it, get them to use them has been, it's very insidious because it's not free at all. And quite frankly, it, they're designed to be highly addictive. And we're learning that as well now that there's a, a, a addictive quality to this by design. Andrew, if I was the, the, the head of the US Postal Service and I came to you and I said, I'm going to give you free stamps I'll, 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 or no stamps. I'm just going to I will take care of your mail for free. No more postage stamps. You might be a little suspicious, but you would listen to my offer because if I could send it for free rather than buying a stamp, why not? And then if I said to you, OK, but in exchange, I want to put a camera in every one of your rooms of your home and in your car and in your workplace. I think you'd be probably reluctant and, and, and then. Yeah, and then, I mean, well, yeah, I, I, it's an interesting comparison, Frank. I'm not sure it works that way. I mean, I thought what you were going to say was if you own the post office, the deal would be you can have free stamps if we can read your letters. And that's perhaps a more exact. I mean, not exact, but that's a, a isn't that a better simile than allowing the post office to watch everything we do? Yeah, maybe I was too wordy because I was going to add exactly that. I was going to say, and in, in, in addition to the cameras, by the way, we're going to open your mail and read it and benefit from everything we we read and and uh, benefit from your relationships. And but it would oh, be uh, it would be an alternative. They might. I, I mean, the 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 the, the post office and um, simile is an interesting one because, of course, the post office has always been a politicized institution in the history of the United States. Some people might say, that's fine. You can read whatever you like. Uh, and if you give me free stamps, it's worth it for me. Other people would object. And I, I, I can't speak, Frank, obviously, on behalf of Silicon Valley. But I think their point would be, even if what you're saying is true, and I think they would dispute it, they would argue that nobody, no, no algorithm, no one at Facebook or Google or X, nobody ever reads the letter. All they're looking for are keywords to serve up advertising, which is their business model. So no one's actually undermining, borrowing language from you, anyone's liberty or humanity or dignity. It's an advertising business, and they're trying to help their clients by identifying uh, uh, effective ways of, 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 of doing advertising online. Well, I, I, you know, you know, I beg to differ. I think that's one of the things they do. But we, we, it's not all, all that they do. The, these, uh, these machines now are able to predict our, they, they've made judgments, assessments of our personality, of our emotional reaction to things, of our makeup, how will, how, what we, what they can feed us more of. It's not just advertising, Andrew. Come on, let's it, let's 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 be realistic. It's what we read, how we think, and and as I said earlier, these are highly addictive, uh, uh, dopamine-inducing uh, models that are harming young children whose brains haven't even fully developed. And it, it's we know it's difficult for an uh, adult addict to sh to to um, rid themselves of the addiction. How on earth can young children do that? So to, to think of this simply as, oh, so a few harmless ads, what's the, tr what's the trouble? Is, is just missing the point massively. How is it possible, Andrew, that we have elections in this country that come down to 5,000 votes or 10,000 votes? 
Is anybody other than myself wondering why? Well, but, 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 but Frank, that was the case back in the Gore Bush controversy, a few hundred votes in Florida and the internet, there wasn't even web 2.0 then. Isn't that reflect the American political system? It's got nothing to do with the internet. I think what, what, what we have is a, is technology in everybody's hands that's designed to polarize us. It's designed to keep us triggered and half the people on one side and half the people on the other side. I, I, I personally believe, and you can agree or disagree with me, that we are losing, we are, this technology is sucking the soul out of us. It's dehumanizing us. And I would say, you know, technology, which is designed to connect machines, we're still IP addresses on the internet, for gosh sakes, we're not even people, is, is, is harmful. Why not put people in charge of their data? Whether you're right or wrong, isn't it better to put people in charge of their own social graph, of their own personal relationships, of their own attributes, and let them, as you say, decide to do whatever they'd like to do with it? I have no problem with that. What I have a problem with is we have no choice. We are being surveilled. We're being, we're being dehumanized. Our information is being taken from us, and it's being used in all kinds of ways. You mentioned a commercial way. Good. Let's talk about that. If it's being used to make trillions of dollars, then why not people who are generating the data benefit from that economically? This is we have moved from uh, subjects to citizens, and now we're moving back from citizens back to subjects again. The the lords this time and the and the and the kings and uh, are just not in robes and crowns. They happen to be in in t-shirts in Silicon Valley, and it's just not right for if one prioritizes democracy and cares about it and prioritizes taking care of, of young kids. How is it that young kids are polled and they don't think their life is gonna be any better than their parents? Is, isn't there something fundamentally wrong when that's well, the that, Of course, but I, again, I don't quite know what, what's that got to do with the internet, the general pessimism these days. Um... Well, I, I, well, read the book because I think it has everything to do with the, uh, with the internet and how it's designed. It was never designed to do what it's doing. It, how is it possible to have something, a communications technology connecting billions of people, and you don't even have to be a person? Or you don't even know if you're talking to a person. You can be a, machi a machine spitting out toxicity and poison and, and fake news. How, is it, how are we going to govern ourselves? How are we going to have a thriving economy if we destroy trust? And you can't argue with me, I don't think, that the internet and social media in particular is destroying trust in society because we don't know what's fact and fiction anymore. And the, and the technology that's developing is getting better and better and better at, at you know, faking, making fake things look real. And you tell me, how do we govern ourselves if we don't have a shared set of facts? How do we govern ourselves if we don't have, if we don't have trust? between us we have a it just we have we have uh, a massive mess it certainly looks like a massive mess uh, um uh frank um i want to get to the fixes because that's i think the core uh, the, the core thing in our biggest fight and you have a maybe a, a web three style fix to the internet but be 